Welcome, Wonderland. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Aaron Hilliard for Mushroom Wonderland. I am the vice president of the local mycological society here in Kitsap County, Washington State. And what I do on this channel is I go out into the woods and see what kind of mushrooms are growing out here and help you to identify what kind of mushrooms you might be seeing trail side in your neck of the woods. So if you're new to this channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, hit that notification bell to see more videos just like this one. Um, today it's the 2nd of December in Western Washington and it is cold. There's traces of snow even around on some of this brush and snow is not super common here in the lowland region of uh, the Puget Sound Basin in Western Washington. So sort of unusual to be having this winter blast. Come with me and my dog Gunner into Mushroom Wonderland and let's go see what we can find. Got right down here, trail side. I see a mushroom growing right down here in the brush. I'm gonna pick this thing all the way from the bottom so we can get a good look at it. I recognize this, you see that? This is a really common popular edible mushroom that grows here in the Northwest. These ones are actually a little bit frozen. They're a little bit crunchy. I'm gonna put them up here on this log so we can have a better look at them. So the first mushroom we've came across today, despite it being freezing and kind of rain snow mix happening right now, this is uh, called a Cantharellus formosus or the Pacific Golden Chanterelle. And so this is probably the most common wild edible sought after mushroom that grows here in the Pacific Northwest. And it's easy to spot. This one is actually not that golden and some people in the comments might be like, that's subalbidus, that is the white chanterelle. But I think these are actually gold chanterelles that have just been washed out by the rain. They're not in very good shape right now. When they're young and fresh and dry, they're often very vibrant gold, orange colored, but as they fade, they get old, they get rain washed out. And, uh, and they kind of look like this. So definitely still a good edible. You could definitely make some good soup with these. And you gotta look for these decurrent gills. Uh, they're not true gills, like a real gilled mushroom kind of looks like slices of paper underneath there. This is uh, more just like ridges that grow around the side of the edge of the cap and they just sort of fade out into the stem and that's called decurrent. So really easy one to identify. There really are no dangerous lookalikes up here uh, that look like a golden chanterelle or any kind of chanterelle. So there you go. There's your uh, wild edible chanterelles. Personally, I can't eat these. They give me really, really bad GI upset. It's like I'm allergic to them. Most people can eat them, but like with any mushroom that you find wild, once you get the confidence to eat it, um, make sure that you just eat a small amount first and make sure to cook it really well because all mushrooms need to be cooked before you eat them. If you wanna derive any of the nutritional benefits from them, um, they do have a lot of protein and a lot of good fats and vitamins and stuff, but you're not going to get any of that unless you cook it and then eat a small amount at first. If you get a bad stomach ache from it, then maybe they're not for you, but most people can eat these ones. The Pacific Golden Chanterelle, Cantharellus formosus. I'm not going to take it with me, sending it back to the woods to release some spores into the air. Let's keep going. Like I mentioned, this has been like a really weird year for mushrooms, uh, especially this autumn. In the spring of 2022, we had amazing morels and you can look back at videos about all the morel hunting that we did. And we went out and uh, went into a forest fire burn and found a bunch of beautiful black morels. It was an amazing year for morels. They were growing everywhere in everybody's gardens and everybody's compost piles and in all of the landscaping wood chips and stuff like that. So we were blessed in the spring, but we're kind of paying for it 
this autumn and it's uh, nearing on winter now. So it's cold here, unusually cold in Western Washington. Like I said, we don't get a ton of snow in this area. So this cold snap is unusual and it undoubtedly will slow down the mycelial growth and the fruit body production of these mushrooms. So what the mushroom actually is, is a fruiting body and the actual organism itself grows underground in what are uh, hyphal structures that are called a mycelium. So that's a huge underground network is the actual body of the mushroom. And then the mushrooms that we see pop up are just the fruiting bodies. And you can kind of compare it to an apple on an apple tree, even though there are definite differences between mycelium and apple trees. But out here in a forest like this, a conifer forest in Western Washington, these big Western hemlocks and these Douglas fir are really good associate trees for fungus. So some of these mushrooms need a mycorrhizal connection. We call it an ectomycorrhizal connection. And the fungus actually attaches to the roots of these trees and they exchange minerals and water and things like that. And so a lot of the mycorrhizal mushrooms, regardless of whether it's rained or not, have found a way to survive here all summer long. So I was finding chanterelles and uh, all kinds of mushrooms during the summer. We had lobster mushrooms early on, and there's still things that are growing out here right now, um, even though the production has slowed down a little bit. So if this is your first year mushroom hunting and you seem a little bit bored, this is an unusually bad year for mushroom hunting. So don't be discouraged. Head out into the woods and you just gotta really get your eyes on. And, uh, and really it's like Easter egg hunting or treasure hunting for adults. So me and Gunnar just love coming out here and looking for mushrooms, whether they be edible or deadly or unknown or hallucinogenic. It's just interesting to find these mushrooms and to see what we call them by name. So as much as I like you watching these videos, you're going to need to get up and go out to the forest after you watch this video so that you get an idea of how to hunt for these mushrooms. So let's go find some mushrooms. So I really don't want to be beating a dead horse, but I have to repeat some of these mushrooms over and over again in a lot of my videos. And so, uh, you know, this is a lot for newbies. And sometimes when you hear these things over and over again, they kind of stick in your memory better. So this one, a really common one, this one looks kind of like some sort of a donut or something like that. A little tree conch, but they get pretty big and it's always growing on a dead tree like this one is a big snag. So this one is known as Fomitopsis mountiae and uh, it is, the, commonly known as the red belted conch super important mushroom probably the most common one you see them growing on trees and logs everywhere in the forest of the pnw and these eat all of the cellulose inside of this dead log and they allow the wood to return to a state of soil so that new trees can grow in it so without these mushrooms we would just be in a big pile of log jam sky high you know so these mushrooms are super good for the ecology not good to eat because it's like eating a chunk of wood or bark or something like that but a really important for the forest so the red belted conch you know when you walk by show a little appreciation for your for your decaying forest friends so yeah if you want to know more about those you got to watch more of my videos because i talk about them in a lot of the videos but for the people who come back again and again I apologize, I don't wanna bore you. Let's keep moving through the forest. So another mushroom that really doesn't mind the cold weather is gonna be Lapista nuda, also known as the blue foot or the bluet, uh, probably most commonly known worldwide as the wood bluet. And so this mushroom is popular all the way from the UK, around Europe, from the Eastern seaboard here to the Pacific Northwest. It's a saprotrophic mushroom and it just, grows wherever it wants to show up, feeding on dead matter in the soil. It doesn't necessarily need trees to grow in association with. And this mushroom can actually be cultivated, but um, you know, you can find it in the wild here quite a bit. And it'll often be brown on the cap, but when you flip it over, it's got this beautiful violet color. Now one really unique thing about this mushroom is that when you split the cap open and you take a good smell of it, it smells just like frozen orange juice concentrate which is the weirdest thing. If you have ever had frozen orange juice concentrate, which I haven't smelled since I was a kid, but I smell this mushroom and it brings me right back. I'm like, that's exactly what it is. And so this mushroom 
Uh, some people really like to eat it, other people not so much. So this is one mushroom that might be confused for a look-alike that grows around here. Uh, Cortinarius can often look like Lapista nuda or the wood bluet. So um, one way you can distinguish the difference is that the spore print of the wood bluet is going to be a pinkish color and the Cortinarius is always a rusty brown color. So Cortinarius, a genus of mushrooms with over 2,000 different species in it. Some of them are deadly poisonous. So this is one mushroom that might not be for the earliest of beginner mushroom foragers, but if you get that orange juice smell and it's unmistakable and you have a pink spore print and purple gills, brown cap, and no cobwebby, cobwebby kind of cortina on it, you know, the, the cobwebs that are kind of dangling off the bottom edge of the cap and on the stem, that would indicate Cortinaria. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much with that. You can find tons of resources to read up on what a Cortinarius looks like compared to Lapista nuda, but here in the Northwest in the winter, the bluet, the wood bluet mushroom, pretty common one to uh, go forage for your basket. I did mention earlier in the video that it was a really good spring for morels and so morels are a really popular wild edible mushroom very strange looking compared to your like grocery store button mushroom but black morels are very very delicious and fun to pick but you're only gonna find those in the spring so some mushrooms are quite seasonal right now in December you're just not gonna find morels it's just not gonna happen just like the chanterelle that grows around here in Washington State cantharellus formosus this mushroom isn't going to occur in uh, the spring. So when you're finding morels, you're not going to come across chanterelles. And they really like a temperature of around 50 to 70 degrees pretty loosely, but somewhere in that range. Right now it's 37 degrees out here, so not a ton of mushrooms growing. There are some mushrooms, though, that break the rule, like Pleurotus, uh, your oyster mushroom. These mushrooms can grow all year round in all kinds of conditions. So I find them in the winter, I'll find them in spring, all through the summer, and they also can be found in fall. So the Pleurotus, a really easy one to cultivate too. Oyster mushrooms are super easy to grow. They eat um, newspapers. When I say they eat newspapers, that's kind of how mushrooms live is they eat decaying matter. So old uh, recycled newspapers can be great, um, great uh, substrate for the Pleurotus ostriatus or Pleurotus uh, digimor, um, all the different strains and species of oyster mushrooms, but they can also be found in a forest just like this. They can be found all over the country, and in fact, all over the world, super duper common. But if you're going out chanterelle hunting, you know, this is uh, the tail end of it. It's usually here in Western Washington, it's usually the end of September through October and November, and then in December, everything's kind of dwindling down, um, but, you know, you can still find some stragglers out here, even though they're often kind of mushy because they've been frozen and stuff. So um, just keep in mind that there are seasons for mushrooms and uh, you're not going to find morels out here this time of year. Some mushrooms growing right here on this uh, dead stick right here laying on the ground and they're pretty well adhered to that stick and when I pick it off of there I notice it's got this really really dark stem and uh, you can see underneath it's got the gills under there so these would be in a class what's uh, loosely and commonly referred to as LBMs little brown mushrooms there's just so many little types of little tiny brown mushrooms that grow in the woods that it can be overwhelming to try to consider um, classifying them all and identifying them all. And so while there's also LBMs, there's also, I guess what we should call LW, or wait, LMMs? LWMs, yeah, <laughs> little white mushrooms. These ones are like white spored and they're known as Mycena and they grow everywhere. And the forest floor right now is just littered with a lot of different species of Mycena. There's thousands of species of these little tiny white spored mushrooms. So there's the LBMs, the little brown mushrooms, and I guess we could call the Mycena uh, LWMs. Why is that so confusing to me? I don't know. Little white mushrooms, 
because these grow all over the forest too. And there's people who spend their whole mycological career just trying to study different mycinoid mushrooms or little tiny white spored mushrooms. But uh, these are beautiful little mushrooms and some of them are quite um, fluorescent and even bioluminescent. A lot of these ones will glow in the dark in the forest around here at night. So some of them are pretty faint and you might just have to be right up next to this to see it glowing at night. But you could come out here with a UV light. Some of these Mycena mushrooms really glow brightly under an ultraviolet light. So they often have a sticky little stem. You see that, how it's stuck to my hand? That's a little wet Mycena. And I don't know exactly what species, but uh, awful cute little guy. So there you go. The LWMs and the LBMs. So this time of year, I would typically be keeping my eyes open for a really valued mushroom that grows around here. And it's usually a later season mushroom, more inland, but it can actually grow in the early season out near the ocean. And whenever I see a big deposit of pine needles like this, true pine needles, often two needle or five needle pine, um, that's when I slow down and start looking for what's commonly called the pine mushroom, or masutake is the common name. Uh, the species that we have right here in the northwest is called Tricholoma muriolenium, and this is a beautiful mushroom. It's changed names quite a few times. It was uh, when I first started mushroom hunting, uh, the mushroom guides would say that this is in the genus Armillaria, so they considered it related to honey mushrooms, but now it's actually in a genus of mushroom called Tricholoma, in which most mushrooms in that genus are not desired edibles, but this one actually can sell for quite big money and gets shipped overseas. It's really popular to forage these here for commercial sale in Washington and Oregon, basically the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Also in Korea and uh, in Japan is the species that fetches the most money. The ones here, if you were to sell them commercially, you might get like $10 a pound. But in Japan, the Tricholoma Matsutake that grows there, they can sell for over $100 a mushroom and at one time were the most expensive mushrooms in the world. So the tricholoma um, or the masutake mushroom, typically I'd be finding it out here this time of year. This year has just been weird. Uh, a couple months ago, I did find them out on the coast, but here inland, I just haven't found them in the patches where I normally would. But the, uh, you know, but you definitely wanna keep your eye out for this one, tricholoma muriolenum or the um, masutake mushroom. So let's keep going. Another really cool mushroom, a really amazing mushroom to find out here in the Pacific Northwest in December will be the candy cap or Lactarius rubitus. And this mushroom is deliciously confectionery. It smells exactly like maple syrup when it's dried out. And you can find these sometimes in big quantities here in Western Washington uh, in late November and in December. I've even found them into January. So the Lactarius rubitus has quite a few lookalikes, luckily none of which are dangerous or really even poisonous. Some of them have a peppery acrid thing going on, but they're really not gonna hurt you. Uh, most of them you could eat if you could tolerate getting past the spiciness of them. But the true Lactarius rubitus is gonna, when you cut the gills of it, it's gonna excrete something called lactation. That's why the genus name is Lactarius. And so this, clear kind of milky looking liquid is going to come out of the gills when you cut them or even the stem and you're not truly going to know until this mushroom is dried but you can use a lighter and just heat up the edge of the mushroom cap and it will put off the scent of maple syrup if that's truly it and trust me if you have to use your imagination at all whatsoever to smell this mushroom it's not it because i've picked these mushrooms before in gloves and when the residue on the gloves dried they smelled like they had been dipped in maple syrup. In fact, I've washed them twice over the past two years and they still stink like maple syrup. It's actually quite unappetizing because the smell is so strong. But when you use them correctly, you can cook them into uh, Christmas treats and really impress your friends with your candy cap cookies. So keep an eye out for Lactarius rubitus or the candy cap mushroom here in the winter. 
in Western Washington. So look at this beautiful flush of red belted conks on this log. So this downed conifer log, this old uh, Douglas fir. Or actually, no, this is a Western hemlock. You can tell the, uh, the bark doesn't have too deep of ridges. So I believe this is a Western hemlock, but a lot of them, Fomitopsis, Mount C.A. These guys are just eating the inside of this log until it will just eventually fall apart back into soil again. There's my boy Gunner. He just loves being out here in the woods. Especially when there's a little snow on the ground, you, you can notice a little extra pep in his step for sure. So these are fun areas to forage in because there's not a lot of underbrush, just a lot of moss, and you can find all kinds of crazy mushrooms. Look at that. Whoa. And it's frozen. Wow, it's poor. It's got a poor surface underneath there. Look at this, Tremedes gabosa. That's a big one. This is related to the turkey tail, but I don't know of anybody using it for any, any kind of specific purpose, but it's got these concentric kind of rings going on, sort of like Tremedes versicolor, but it's all white. It's like an albino turkey tail, but it's thick, really thick and pretty, pretty fleshy. And then look under here, it's got this poor surface. So instead of gills, it has little tiny holes, just like the red belted conks. But this one's kind of unique. Tremedes gibosa. Uh, this one's pretty old. As you can see, it kind of fell off there pretty easy, but growing at the base of this dead little conifer. So cool. That guy really kind of stands out in a forest like this where everything's green and brown. But what a beautiful day in the woods out here. All right, look at this. So these log dwelling mushrooms are really, really uh, enjoying it because there's moisture in these logs, no matter how dry it's actually been, uh, the logs keep their moisture, but look at this. So we got big Fomitopsis mountiers, red belted conks everywhere. And then right here, this little boogery orange mushroom, and they are frozen solid. Otherwise they're quite boogery, look at that. Yeah, beautiful. So these ones, uh, some people call them witch's butter, the conifer witch's butter. You know, some people get upset when I um, assign the wrong common name to the wrong fungus. But an orange jelly fungus that's growing here amongst the uh, conifer logs. The one that is growing uh, as a parasite to sterium on hardwood trees is the true uh, witch's butter, Tremella mesoteneca uh, or mesenterica or however you say that. And then this one is actually Dacromyces chrysospermus, so an orange jelly fungus that grows on conifers, and it's equally as edible. So whatever, common names are common names, and that's why some of them are regional, and so which is butter in a different part of the world might be, might be a different mushroom. Wow, we found a really interesting mushroom growing right here. Very dark colored. Wow, you see the cap on that? Check this thing out. That is one handsome, thick looking mushroom. Growing off a of wood right there. And you can see where it was attached to the log. This one's got really white gills. And it's got a really, really dark cap. And this is actually frozen. It's a, it's a mushroom sickle. But this one can come in a lot of different looking shapes. And this one's actually known as the deer mushroom or the deer shield mushroom. Ploteus cervinus. So this one might actually be the other one that occurs here, Pluteus exilis. Um, so a later season Pluteus or Pluteus mushroom. And so these ones, like Lapista nuda, have a pink spore. So if you're to lay this cap down on a piece of paper, you'll see that it drops pink spores out of these gills. This one you could eat, but nobody really does. I don't, I don't really know why. I've never eaten it. And I think it's just because nobody does eat them. But, uh, but it is edible and just not very desired. So I'm actually gonna take this home to do some microscopy on it and look at the gills and stuff up close on the Pluteus exilis and maybe through my microscopy, I can determine which species this is. But beautiful uh, wood loving mushroom, the deer mushroom, the deer shield mushroom, Pluteus exilis slash cervinus, not exactly sure. But either way, kind of a cool find right here in December. 
All right, so what I typically collect my mushrooms in, because I'm not really out here to pick a bunch of edible mushrooms, I just wanna study them and collect some of the mushrooms. So I carry this Plano fishing tackle box that is uh, compartmentalized so I can keep my mushrooms kind of separated, mainly just so that the spores don't cross each other and confuse me on the microscope. But I can carry a whole bunch of different mushrooms in this little tiny uh, toolbox. And then I keep the toolbox in my backpack. Um, another thing I carry in my backpack is gonna be this net foraging bag. So in case I come across a bunch of good edible mushrooms, I can pull this out and I can haul a lot of mushrooms in here. I'll put a link in the description to this foraging bag, and it's just super good to carry with you. And if you find a whole bunch of chanterelles or matsutake or candy caps or whatever, I fill this thing up and it's mesh so it sprinkles spores across the forest floor while you're walking. So really kind of cool. And I just keep it in the bottom of my backpack just in case, and it's came in handy a ton of times. So check out the uh, description on this video. I'll put a link in it for that net bag and for one of these, just to make it easy for you. And uh, you know, while I'm at it, I might as well just show you, this is the mushroom knife that I carry with me. And it's a Gather Americana. I found this on Amazon. I'll put the link to this in the description. What a sharp little knife. It's even got a brush on the other end so I can brush off the chanterelles when they have little pine needles and fur needles on them. And I also carry a hand lens so that it's a miniature magnifying glass or a jeweler's loop. And I can look really closely at certain mushrooms out in the field to help determine certain characteristics about them. And this fits nicely in my backpack again. Another thing, I'll put the link down there in the description. I also carry some tweezers in case I have little tiny mushrooms that I want to move around for photography or anything. And those are kind of my basic mushroom hunting little apparatuses and that. And then I carry a, a little survival bag as well in Ziploc. And I have another knife and a Leatherman. I have some medical tape in case I twist my ankle or something out in the woods. There's a compass with a whistle and some alcohol swabs and some recycled napkins in case nature calls and you're out in the woods and you need to you know, do your business. Maybe bury it under a log or dig a hole. So yeah, that's kind of an overview of my backpack. And today it's chilly, so a nice pair of gloves, nice warm socks and a beanie. Just be prepared when you head out into the woods so that you don't end up getting frozen or lost or whatever. And if you do get lost, you know, have some things on you to make your trip a little more comfortable until you find your way back. So. Let's get moving. All right, so this is the part where I've, I'm at home now. I'm nice and warm. There were a couple of mushrooms that I found on the way out that I didn't get in the video because my camera actually, the battery died. But here's our Pluteus or Pluteus cervinus, the uh, deer shield mushroom. Um, right here are these, these little interesting ones that I'm not really sure what they are. So we're going to learn about those. Um, right here I found a Gomphidius subroseus. Oh, it's very slimy. So Gomphidius, so he's got a really yellow foot and decurrent vein, gills like that. It's kind of gray colored, the hideous Gomphidius. Pretty common, and these grow in association with Suillus. I think they eat them. They're a parasite to Suillus mushrooms. So the sticky Gomphidius, or maybe they're actually a filter, like a kidney. I can't remember which one it is, but they have something to do with Suillus. And then this guy... Here's that cobwebby thing I was talking about on Lapista nuda, on bluets. If it's a Cortinarius, it's going to have this cobwebby stuff attaching the uh, the cap to the stem. And so this is in the genus Cortinarius, and I found this on my way out. And so I want to study all of these, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut them and put them into my little dehydrator and let them dehydrate so that I can put them on a microscope slide and look at them on my microscope and the uh, pluteus has really interesting like 
deer antler shaped uh, chylocystidia, I believe. So yeah, we're gonna put these on the dehydrator and then mount a slide and see what a pluteus gill and spores look like. So some of it's gonna go down on paper for a spore print and some will go in the dehydrator. All right, so the way I'm gonna do the spore print for the pluteus is I'm gonna get a microscope slide out because I'm doing microscope stuff. I'm laying it down on this purple piece of construction paper. Black works nice too, or even white. But a spore print like this might not show up on the white so well. So first I'm gonna detach the stem from the cap. Just break it off of there, that's fine. And now I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna use this scalpel and actually cut a piece of the cap off. There we go. That's gonna be good for the dehydrator. And then this guy, I'm gonna lay it halfway on my microscope slide, halfway on the paper. This way it's gonna drop spores right onto my slide, as well as onto the paper. And we'll see what color spores are really easily that way. And so this is gonna go down onto my dehydrator. And then here's the Pluteus. This one, we're really excited to see what it looks like under the microscope, but you want to have it dry when you, when you put it, when you're going to use it for microscopy, because otherwise it's too big when it's wet like this. We want to cut like super small pieces. And then here's a piece of the cordonarius and I'm going to set them on here. This little dehydrator was like 40 bucks on Amazon. So I'll put the link to that as well in the description. Super easy. I just start it up and it just blows like hot air up through these grates and it'll dry these out in a matter of a couple hours. So tonight I can mount up a slide with a gill and we can see what, uh, what the deer mushroom looks like under the microscope. All right, so I actually left this running overnight. But here are our specimens. And just potato chip, crispy dry. So we're gonna take these upstairs to the laboratory and we can mount a slide and have a look at them. here's our comfidius oops cortinarius our mystery mushrooms there's our cortinarius cool so now we can take these back up to the microscope all right, so here's our spore prints the next day. And look at that, you can see this real powdery deposit of this pink colored spores. And we have it all over our slide. So we're gonna put this under the microscope and see what the pluteus spores look like. And I'm not gonna show you all of these because this really isn't a microscopy video. I'm just showing you how to do uh, real mycology on mushrooms for identification. So now we've identified, we got a pink spore print and we'll look at this under the, uh, under the scope. All right. So here's my slide. I'm going to put just a drip of water on it. Oh, there's a lot of drips of water, but that's okay. And then I've got a cover slip. I'm going to drop this cover slip on there. Don't touch it with your fingers or you'll get oil on them. I take a paper towel to kind of dab it dry. And put it on the scope. Turn on the light. Now I'm going to focus it with a very small objective. This is the one time, the ten times objective. And then I can go to higher objectives, which means I can look close, more closely at them. And wow, there they are. Kind of floating in the water. A lot of them are moving. There's your pluteus spores. Pretty. So now you have to measure 30 of them if you want to 
have a conclusive number for the size of the spores. So it can be a lot of work, but they make software for that. Or you can compare these to pictures of Pluteus spores online. You would definitely have a match. And now we're going to take a piece of the gill and look at it under the microscope as well. All right, so here's our piece of Pluteus. In a perfect world, we would be using a dissection scope to do this, but I don't have one. So I'm just going to take a little piece of this gill out with these forceps. And it seems little, but it's actually pretty big. Like Alan Rockefeller says, if you can see it, it's too big. I asked him, well, how do you see it then? If it's the right size. And he said, well, you can almost see it. <laughs> so I'm going to take a little drip of 70% isopropyl rubbing alcohol. And drip it right onto our specimen to hydrate it. And I'm going to use this another slide on top of it to try to make some sections that are just super duper small and I'm sort of using it as a guide to slice it into small little sections. And a lot of this is practice. And I'm not that great at it, but you know, I'll be able to see some of the features of what this mushroom holds. So, sliced it pretty thin. And I'm going to take my forceps again. Try to find a very small couple of little pieces. That one's very small. I almost can't see it, so that's good. You can still see those. All right, that means it's a little too big, but that's okay. It's enough to give you the gist of things, right? And we're going to take another cover slip. This one, I'm just going to do a water mount again. One drip of water. Cover slip goes on. You can lightly kind of push it down. And use this to kind of dab off the extra moisture. And we're ready to put it under the scope. All right, so now we're, we'll take our uh, slide with the spores off. I'm going to put this gill mount on the scope. And again, start with the small objective to identify our piece. So this is at 10 times magnification. So one of the characteristics of the pluteus that you can see in a microscope is going to be the cystidia has two little points, two or three little points on top of the cell that kind of look like antlers. And I've heard that that's why it's called a deer mushroom. And you can see those little cells right there. Dang it. Right there. And it looks like they have little antlers on them now. Yeah? So kind of cool. And there's basidia in there that are creating spores. Um, but there you go. There's a super simple introduction of microscopy to just show you a little bit of what I do to try to narrow down the species and genus of these mushrooms. But there's a couple types of pluteus that exist here. And these ones um, are the darker cap one, which is said to be pluteus exilis rather than Pluteus cervinus. So, so kind of neat to look at that under the scope there 
and we can even go deeper and go a thousand times magnification and really look at the uh, basidia where the spores are being produced so but there you go super introduction if you like that kind of video please let me know in the comments and i will do microscopy videos to show you some more of the features so thanks for watching peace